It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. So, thanks very much, Speaker. Speaker, my first question this morning is uh, to the Premier. It's now been six days since the Long-Term Care Commission uh, issued its report outlining the horrifying conditions in long-term care uh, as COVID-19 ripped through, uh, as well as this government's failure uh, to protect seniors. In fact, I quote from the report, they said, alarm bells should have been ringing loudly in Ontario. There was no plan to protect residents in long-term care. The Premier and the Minister all summer long claimed that there was an iron ring around long-term care, and everybody knew that there was no such thing, and yet nobody on the government side is prepared to take responsibility for the tragedies, the horrifying tragedies that took place in long-term care. When is this Premier going to do the right thing and remove the Minister of Long-Term Care? To reply, I recognize the Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I first want to acknowledge the families who loved ones uh, were impacted by what happened in long-term care homes. It was a tragedy and it was absolutely terrible. Our government called the Commission to action to provide accountability and justice for the families as soon as possible. It is now all of our responsibilities to fix a system that no government has gotten right. Not Bob Ray, not Mike Harris, not Dalton McGuinty, not Kathleen Wynne. The final report shows what we've been saying all along. After years of neglect by governments of all political stripes, red, orange, and blue, our long-term care system was broken. But, Mr. Speaker, we're the government who will finally fix it. According to the Commission report, I'll quote, many of the challenges that had festered in long-term care sector for decades Chronic underfunding, severe staffing shortages, outdated infrastructure and poor oversight contributed to deadly consequences for Ontario's most vulnerable citizens during this pandemic. The supplementary question. Well, Speaker, part of the Premier's problem is nobody has taken accountability for what happened in long-term care through the first and second waves. And there's no denying that decades of Mike Harris and Dalton McGuinty and Kathleen Wynne and Stephen Del Duca were a big part of the mess in long-term care. But this government, this government Order. has to take some responsibility for the cuts that it made in 2018, cancelling the comprehensive inspections. In 2019, cutting funding for long-term care and for public health. No single home has lost a license. There has been no minister that has lost their job. There have been literally no consequences for the horrors that families lived through uh, through COVID-19 in long-term care. Why does this premier continue to protect his minister instead of showing families that someone will step up and take responsibility? The premier needs to do that by removing the minister of long-term care from her portfolio. The premier. Well, through, through you, Mr. Speaker, I have full confidence in my minister. She's done more as a doctor to serve Order. those most in need than anyone in this chamber, anyone, bar none, for 30 years. She's dedicated her life to protecting the most vulnerable, caring for those who are sick on the front lines, and that deserves respect. Her voice and experience are vital as we correct the decades of inaction in long-term care sector caused by many governments. Because of her leadership, we're already seeing success in this uh, sector. For example, thousands of new long-term care beds being built, the implementation of four hours of care, and hiring thousands and thousands of new PSWs. And the final supplementary. Speaker, it's a... Uh... It's absolutely disheartening to hear this Premier defending his Minister of Long-Term Care instead of having spent the last year defending seniors who were losing their lives to COVID-19. I want to tell the Premier something that I asked his Minister on Monday. I want him to hear what I asked her. The Commission, of course, had a number of family stories that they outlined which were just horrifying. Uh, but on Monday, here's the, the one I decided to bring forward, and I quote, Of all the pictures I have of my mother over the years, the one that's burned into my mind forever is her lying there in a wet diaper without even a blanket to cover her, with her arm up, stretched in the air, begging for water, and asking God why he had forsaken her. Speaker, 
This can never happen again in our province. Frontline workers, family members have no confidence in this government, in this minister, in this premier to fix long-term care. The very least this premier should do is show some accountability. Fire Boston. that minister from her position because nobody has any faith in her ability to fix the system. And the Premier to respond. Kirk, you know, what I do agree with the Leader of the Opposition, it was a tragedy. And it's heartbreaking hearing these stories over and over again for decades of, of neglect. And, you know, we, we, we saw this happen in, in right across the, the province. But, you know, we, we looked at, let's use Roberta Place in Barrie, that the UK variant got in there. One person wiped out all over Roberta Place. The mortalities was up close to 100. The infections was 200 because the variants got into our country. Just one person. Yesterday, 12 people that we know of, that we know of just going through the airport, came in with COVID. That's 12 people. Multiply that by 10 in a day if they, if they don't stay at home, because they aren't staying at home, by the way, Mr. Speaker. We need the federal government to stop the leak. It's like the, the, there's a hole in the roof and the water's pouring in and the federal government's just not doing anything about it. Response? And it continues to spread. As we, all frontline healthcare workers are working hard, everyone's getting uh, vaccines, we're working around the clock, but there's a gaping hole right now. And I'm asking once again for the federal government to tighten up our borders until we don't see this tragedy happen in any long-term care. Thank you. The next question, the Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, my next question is to the Premier, but the people of Ontario deserve more than a Premier that just deflects to another order of government. Residents uh, and families are desperate for change in long-term care, but we got a pretty clear signal yesterday that that change is nowhere to be found. Uh, for example, top executives at for-profit long-term care chains collected massive bonuses during 2020, while literally thousands of seniors were dying in long-term care. The CEO of, of Extended Care was paid $1.7 million. The outgoing CEO of Siena, $4.7 million. The Extended Care is the same chain, uh, long-term care chain that operated Orchard Villa, where some of the most horrifying situations occurred, where people were dying of neglect and dehydration. Can the Premier, how can the Premier continue to defend making profits in long-term care, continue to shovel public dollars at for-profit long-term care homes in our province. This should stop. Will he make that commitment? And the Premier, Through you, Mr. Speaker, I, I know it's easy for the Leader of the Opposition to blame my great minister, but the buck stops with me. That's what it stops with. It stops with me, and I'll take responsibility Order. across the province, and I'll tell you what we're doing to correct it. Just think of 15 years under the NDP and Liberals, and especially the last few years, 2011, 2018, 611 beds were put together out of all those years. I'll tell you what we're doing to fix it. As a province, as the Ontario government is moving forward with 80 new long-term care projects, which will lead to an additional 7,510 new beds, 4,197 upgraded long-term care spaces, Ontario is investing over $933 million in these projects province-wide. On top of that, $1.75 billion already earmarked for delivery of 30,000, compare 611 Response. to 30,000 new spaces over 10 years. We're hiring over 27,000 PSWs and nurses. That's 27,000. We recognize there was a problem. We recognize there was a massive problem. But guess what? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. There is absolutely no doubt in anyone's mind that the long-term care system is a broken system. But here's another example of how uh, this government uh, is prepared to carry on. Siena and Extended Care took $157 million in COVID funding. And the government continues to shovel more money uh, at those operators. These are operators uh, in which their homes were literally uh, scenes of horror for residents and family members, homes like Orchard Villa. The sector uh, is one in which these bonuses are being paid while senior executives are mocking grieving family members, suggesting uh, that they're launching blood-sucking lawsuits. These are the, the buddies of this government. In fact, to add insult to in injury today, 
the Minister of Energy appointed one of the vice presidents of for-profit Extendicare to the board of the IESO. A nice, cushy oh. appointment by this government. Will no one on Order. the government side ever step up Question. and stand up for the families and the victims in long-term care instead of their friends and buddies in the for-profit industry? Thank you. Thank you. The members of King Center Just, just, sec, just, sec, just a second. I, I recognize the Premier. Hey, again, I have no buddies in long-term care, but you know who my buddies are? Are the frontline PSW, order. the nurses that are, are working Member the backs off. Ottawa Centre, come to order. We're, Mr. Speaker, we're the first government in Ontario and Canada, and I'm, I'm sure probably one of the first in North America, that will direct four hours of care on the average to every long-term care resident. Mandating air conditioning, and I want to give the, the reporter from CBC, they deserve the credit, mandating air conditioning in long-term care homes, investing over $100 million to train up 8,200 PSWs. Our government has approved nearly $2 billion in staffing, as I said earlier, for 27,000 new staff. Over the few short years, we're investing more than $9.6 billion. The previous government and then NDP that supported them for years never ever invested. Mr. Speaker, we're Response? exceeding the NDP's own platform target of 30% increase in spending by 2028. We're exceeding what they were, they were asking for. With our pandemic pay program alone, we hired 8,636. Thank you. Thank you, Premier. Thank you very much. Please take your seat. The final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, nearly 4,000 people lost their lives to COVID-19 in long-term care, and thousands of, of others uh, lost their lives to neglect and dehydration in long-term care. The Minister of Long-Term Care has not taken any responsibility. She has shown no remorse for what happened. The government plan that the Premier likes to talk about is way too late. The Commission said clearly the changes have to happen now, not in 2025. So I ask the Premier again, will he do the right thing, show the families, the survivors, the families of victims of COVID-19 and long-term care, that he understands that his minister has no credibility, that families don't trust her, they don't believe in her and fire her so that they can maybe find somebody to do the job properly. And to reply, the Premier. Well, you, you know something, Mr. Speaker? I'll stand up for my minister all day long because the Leader of the Opposition leader wasn't of the opposition on the come calls to till midnight that I would be speaking to the minister day after day after day, the conference calls, her leading the charge, making sure that the appropriate changes that were ignored for decades, for decades, Mr. Speaker, she showed leadership. It was a, it was, it was a terrible, terrible situation. Order. It was an absolute tragedy that happened, not just here in Ontario, around the world. We saw what happened in the U.S. We saw what happened across Canada with long-term care. It was a tragedy. But, Mr. Speaker, we're gonna, we're gonna fix it. We're gonna make sure we fix it. And, and again, the Mr. Speaker, we, I will take personal responsibility. We will make sure we fix it. We will make sure that we have rapid builds. We're going to make sure we hit our target of 30,000 new beds over the next 10 years. We're well on our way. This will never happen again. Thank you. Order. Order. The next question, the member for Brampton Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Long-Term Care. Speaker, the Minister has been running from the press gallery. Uh, she's been hiding from her record of failure. But you know who can't run, Speaker, and who can't hide? The thousands of Ontarians that died in long-term care, or the staff that had to watch painfully as residents took their last breath and they wept through their face shields and masks those folks, they can't hide, Speaker, and this minister stood by and watched this all unfold. Will she finally show some leadership, apologize to these families and staff, and will she resign? Minister of Long-Term Care. 
Thank you, Speaker. And, and uh, you know, I certainly understand the, the, the upset from the, from the families. And the Commission has been very clear, the, the, the report. It indicates the long-standing issues, the structural issues, the staffing issues in long-term care. And, and absolutely, I've been very clear and repeated this numerous times that I do take responsibility for the well-being of residents in long-term care. I do take responsibility for the staff and the families. Member for so Ottawa exactly South come to why I came to politics, because I recognized the importance of long-term care. I recognized that for decades, the measures weren't being taken. So long before the pandemic came, I was taking responsibility for this, trying to get to this place, to be able to make the changes necessary, which we've done. We already started with a staffing, uh, a staffing study, the capacity building, 15,000 new beds in five years, 30,000 new beds in 10 years, the, the commitment to four hours of direct care, innovative programs like the community paramedicine to keep people in their own homes, the infection prevention and control, the integration with hospitals and public health. We will we'll continue to do this because we are committed to solving the problems in long-term care so that this doesn't happen. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary question. Speaker, with all due respect to the minister, these families are not just upset. They are dealing with trauma, with pain, with mental health impacts that will last for much longer than I think this minister understands. Speaker, let's recap what we've heard from the minister this week. She said that she didn't start the fire in long-term care. She said that the death of 4,000 Ontarios was, Ontarians was overdue. And she said that she has nothing to apologize for. She even said that it's everyday Ontarians who need to do some, and I'll quote, soul searching about why conservatives let their loved ones suffer and die from neglect. Speaker, this minister didn't take action when she was supposed to. They didn't hire PSWs over the summer. They didn't increase infection control measures in our long-term care homes. They failed to act. So the only order. one that needs to do some soul searching, Mr. Speaker, is this minister, and she needs to resign. When is she going to do that? Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker. I know, I know very clearly what is true and what is not true. Uh, when we look at the, uh, the response to the, uh, the outbreaks in our homes, we were working round the clock uh, to address the, the capacity issues, the overcrowding in long-term care, to address the staffing, making sure that we were taking every measure possible, integrating the acute care sector into long-term care homes, the public health uh, inspections, the public health efforts to support these homes, and, the, and, and training uh, people during this time to make sure we had the workforce necessary, starting with the staffing plan uh, that we had already undertaken and begun, and hiring over 8,600 people into long-term care with the pandemic pay. Uh, with the efforts in infection prevention and control, we were able to reduce uh, the, the, the level of severity of the outbreaks. And I'm so grateful to the, the hospitals for coming to our Spons. aid when it was necessary. We were making sure all these levers were being taken, and we were continuing to advance long-term care on the staffing, the four hours of care, on the capacity, on the innovation programs, on the infection prevention. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Northumberland, Peterborough South. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, speaker, over the past number of months, as I and members in this legislature have been dealing with the very real conversations with constituents about variants of concern uh, wreaking havoc in our, in our communities, Mr. Speaker, I join members on this side of the House in making the very real and difficult decisions to protect the health and well-being of Ontarians throughout this province. And I know that one thing has remained consistent. Since the very beginning, our Premier has led the charge in calling for the federal government to address these variants of concern at the source. I know, in fact, in the last number Order. of weeks, our government has written a series of letters to the federal government asking for stricter measures at both land and air borders. Mr. Speaker, my question is uh, to the Minister of Small Business and Red Tape Production. My question is, what was in those letters, question. and what has the response been since we sent those letters? Thank you, Speaker. The Associate Minister for Small Business and Red Tape Production. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and to the member for that question. Mr. Speaker, our government has done its part by restricting uh, travel by land at both the Manitoba and Quebec borders. Unfortunately, 
We have heard no official response from the federal government outlining the concerns that we have with our border and the holes in our border. Mr. Speaker, 90 per cent of cases today are made up of variants of concern. We have three very simple requests to the federal government. Ban all non-essential travel uh, into Canada and uh, specifically Ontario. Uh, implement PCR testing for domestic flights and close the loopholes at our land borders, Mr. Speaker. It is absolutely incredible how individuals are flaunting the fact on social media that they are flying into Buffalo, New York, and walking across the border and putting the health and safety of Response. all Ontarians Order. in jeopardy. Mr. Speaker, we join the Premier in asking the federal government to have stronger measures and to secure our borders. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that answer. A speaker, many of my constituents are making very real sacrifices across our community. We're seeing these sacrifices across Ontario. Ontarians want their lives back. Yet we continue to see individuals flaunt loopholes at our land border crossings and getting around screening measures at the border that they know are in place to stop variants of concern from entering. We must do more. Just yesterday, Speaker, the Prime Minister and health officials were asked about how many people are circumventing these rules at the land border. In response, the Public Health Agency of Canada said they don't know, they don't have a specific number. Well, Mr. Speaker, that's not good enough. That's not good enough for the small businesses, for the health care workers, and for the people across my riding making sacrifices each and every day so that we can get our lives back. Speaker, this is very concerning for Ontarians across this country, and I'd Question. like to know, can the minister please respond to these concerns, and what more are we doing to address this? Thank you. The Associate Minister. Mr. Speaker, since February, over 5,000 people have tested positive for COVID because of air travel. In the past two weeks, we have over 150,000 people crossing our borders by land, and that does not include commercial truck drivers. We know that 90 per cent of cases today in Ontario are variants of concern. We've seen other countries across the world, whether it's Australia, New Zealand, enact stronger measures at their borders to protect people in their own, in their own countries. We have now confirmed cases of the B1617 variant in Ontario, British Columbia, and Quebec. We are asking and pleading with the federal government to close the loopholes, to secure our borders, so as we continue to vaccinate hundreds of thousands of Response. people in Ontario, that our recovery is not jeopardized. We need the federal government to step up and secure our borders. Thank you. The next question, the member for Niagara Centre. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Long-Term Care. The Long-Term Care Commission has revealed what anyone with a family member in a for-profit long-term care facility already knew, that decades of neglect left long-term care residents vulnerable, that this government was not prepared for a pandemic, and that this government ignored the warnings of the risk that COVID posed to long-term care residents. I heard from a constituent in Welland whose mother was placed into Royal Rose Place, a for-profit long-term care home. Over the course of only five months, she saw her mother's health deteriorate, she had two ulcers, constant urinary tract infections, and was left in soiled diapers for hours. Complaint after complaint to the ministry went unaddressed until her mother passed just a few weeks ago. When will this minister take responsibility for her government's lack of action and for what is happening to seniors in long-term care under her watch, apologize and resign? Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank, thank you, Speaker. And, you know, I certainly... Um, I certainly want to reiterate the, uh, the concerns over the long-standing issues in long-term care, the tragedy that this was and is ongoing as we deal with this collectively uh, in Ontario, across Canada and around the world. Uh, we continue to take measures in, 
in long-term care. And we initiated these as soon as we became a ministry, and even before that, as a government, to understand the, the capacity issues, to understand the, the, the staffing issues. And that's exactly what we've been addressing. And we were in touch with these homes on a regular basis, monitoring what was going on, and, and moving as quickly as we could, using every lever possible. And that's why we're committed to the four hours of direct care. That's why we're investing unprecedented amounts in long-term care for staffing, for capacity building, for infection prevention and control, for integration with, with the hospital sector Response. and public health. And that's why we are committed, because we've seen the tragedy and we know the neglect of this sector. And we are committed to moving forward, taking the measures necessary to address this. We will fix it. Thank you. Speaker, what is happening today in long-term care rests on the shoulders of this government. For the Minister of Long-Term Care to claim that she holds no responsibility for what's happening in long-term care is not believable. I was contacted by another constituent whose mother was at Royal Rose Place. Her mother has dementia. She got COVID along with 77 other residents in the 96-bed long-term care home. She had great difficulty recovering and has since suffered seven falls and a few weeks ago broke her neck. They filed a number of complaints with the ministry to no avail, no response. Just this week, five staff and six more residents tested positive for the virus at Royal Rose Place. Will this minister stop shifting the blame, take responsibility and resign? Mr. Long -term care. Thank you, Speaker. And I have consistently taken responsibility, and I have said numerous times, I take full responsibility for the well-being of residents in long-term care, staff, families, and that is why I came to politics, to address this long-standing issue. The Commissioner's report, the Auditor General's report have been very clear about the long-standing issues, and that's exactly what we're addressing with the staffing crisis that was pre-existing, with hiring over 8,600 people into long-term care uh, after the, the first wave with the pandemic pay over the summer, making sure that we understood the issues of capacity and creating innovative programs to address that, looking at the infection prevention and control, investing in that, making sure that there was leads in the homes and, and IPAC hubs for this, making sure that we were integrated with the public health units and the hospital sector. And again, I want to thank everyone that came to long-term care's uh, aid uh, during this very, very tragic time. And so I take full responsibility, Response. and our government takes responsibility for fixing the system that was broken, and we are committed to doing that, and we will continue to do this. Our, our actions demonstrate this, whether it's capacity, staffing, infection prevention and control, innovative programs, integration, we'll continue to work on this. Thank you. The next question, the member for Guelph. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. 3,771 people died in long-term care, more in the second wave than in the first wave. So instead of blaming others, I think the people of this province want a simple apology from their Premier and from the Minister of Long-Term Care. They want the Minister to take the time to answer questions and to commit to a complete overhaul of the long-term care system, starting with putting care before profits. So, Speaker, I have a simple yes or no question for the Premier. Will the Premier commit today to the people of this province that the government will immediately begin to implement all, all 85 recommendations from the Long-Term Care Commission? And to reply on behalf of the government, the Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker. And, and uh, you know, in terms of the uh, Commission on Long-Term Care, there are 85 recommendation, recommendations. They're all very insightful. Some of the recommendations we're well on our way to completing or have completed. Some others will take more work and an understanding of how they can be implemented. But we're absolutely committed uh, to the insightful recommendations and the report. Uh, that, the, um, that they have provided to us, the commissioners. We are tremendously grateful for, for that insight. And so, yes, we acknowledge the importance of the commissioners' recommendations. There's no question about that. Uh, in terms of taking responsibility, uh, we have, in fact, more so than any other previous government um, in the history, in the history of this province for long-term care. Uh, Donna Duncan from the OLTCA indicated that publicly. And so when we look at what the mess was, 
We are addressing this. Response. The staffing, four hours of direct care, yeah. the capacity, the innovative programs, <laughs> taking, making sure that we never let this happen again. And so we will do that. Thank you. The supplementary question. Speaker, sadly, for the people who lost loved ones in long-term care homes, I take it from that response that the answer is no. It's one thing to say, yes, we acknowledge recommendations. It's another thing to say that we will immediately begin to implement recommendations. I want to quote from the Commission report. The working conditions in long-term care homes must be improved in order to better attract, recruit, develop, and retain staff. This includes guaranteeing PSWs full-time work and living wages. So, Speaker, if the government is not going to commit today to implementing all 85 recommendations in the Long-Term Care Commission report, will the minister at least commit today to extending the, and making it permanent the pandemic pay increase for PSWs, which is set to expire on June 30th? Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker. You know, I think the member opposite is saying it in a different way. I have said that we will look at all those recommendations, and some of them are already done. Some of them need to be done. Others, we have to understand how to do them. And so, absolutely, uh, when we look at the, the PSWs in our long-term care system, they are the backbone, and I will say they're also the heart mm -hmm. of, of our system. Right. And so, we have been very supportive of the PSWs to understand what we can do to help them with the pandemic pay, with the temporary wage increase, and looking at ways that we can make sure that they are supported uh, and recognized for the important work that they do. And the Premier has been very clear. Everything is on the table. And so while we work through this process, while we take the insights of the Commission and the Auditor General to heart, we are committed to addressing these long-standing issues like no other government in the history of this province. The next question, the member for Northumberland, Peterborough South. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Small Business and Red Tape Reduction. Uh, Speaker, I just got an email from a constituent, literally just got an email. They were asking about the leadership that they've seen from the Premier on border measures, but they were confused because they hadn't seen anything from the federal government. And I quote, Thanks, Dave. We are flying into Buffalo Order. in June and walking across the border to avoid the mandatory three-day stay at a hotel. Right here, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we know that these loopholes are being exposed. We know that this is how variants of concern are entering our country. In fact, 90 per cent of daily cases are variants of concern, and the dominant strain is the UK variant of concern. Speaker, when we look abroad, we see the UK that has imposed travel restrictions and banned travel from over 40 countries worldwide. We know Australia is limiting travel to domestic nationals only or nationals of New Zealand. So, Question. Speaker, I don't understand why certain opposition members and political party would choose to make light of these very serious issues, these very serious concerns that the Premier of this province is flagging. Joined by Minister Collins Thank you. across this province. Thank you. Speaker, Take your seat. Take your seat. Associate Minister of Small Business and Red Tape Production. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. And I agree with uh, the member opposite. Any political party or leader that is um, against combating new variants that are coming into this province, which are deadlier and can, uh, are more transmissible, and making it about racial politics is completely wrong. Are the premiers of the Atlantic uh, bubble, Atlantic uh, provinces, racist for implementing the Atlantic bubble? Is the Prime Minister of New Zealand racist for calling for stronger and enacting stronger measures at the border? Is the Prime Minister of Australia racist for enacting stronger measures at the border? No, this is about protecting Member our Ottawa, South, come to The order. City of Brampton has put forward a unanimous uh, motion supported by all members of can uh, Council Member to for support Ottawa, South, come to order. air travel into this country. This is nothing about race, Mr. Speaker. This is about protecting our province. It's about protecting cities like Brampton. It's about protecting from these deadlier variants of concern. And that's why we need stronger measures at our border. Stop the clock.
can start the clock. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you uh, to the minister for that answer. You know, as we heard um, members opposite, Liberal members heckle on why aren't you doing it, this really speaks to what we need to see across this province. We've seen our municipalities link arms. I had 10 municipal leaders, two Indigenous leaders in our community, write a joint letter calling on the federal government to work with the province to implement stricter border measures. We've seen, as the member mentioned, unanimous motions moved in some of the most diverse communities in this province, because what we all understand is that this isn't a matter of race. This is a matter of working together to protect the health and well-being of the people we have the honour to serve in this place. We have a Premier who continues to stand up to call on the federal government to fix mm -hmm. these loopholes, to call on the federal mm -hmm. government to implement mandatory PCR testing. Question. So, Speaker, I know that there are a suite of measures we can use, including PCR testing. Can the minister please speak to what more measures we can do to protect the health and well-being of the people we have the honour to serve in this place? Thank you. The Associate Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. We know that since February, over 5,000 cases, uh, positive cases of COVID-19 have come through uh, travel. Mr. Speaker, that doesn't even account for the thousands uh, because of that travel that uh, go across the community. There are holes in our border, and we need those loopholes to be addressed. The Premier has called, you know, our ministers have written three letters to the federal government and have received no response. Our ask is simple. Close the loopholes at our land borders. Let's ensure that there are a PCR testing for domestic flights. And let's also ensure that there's, no, uh, there's non-essential travel into Canada, specifically Ontario, is restricted. We've done our part at the Manitoba and Quebec borders. We restricted travel by land and by water. We need the federal government to step up and to secure our borders so we can continue to fight this third wave and we can continue to vaccinate people and get back and support our small Response. businesses, get the economy opening, but we need the federal government to act and secure our borders immediately. Thank you. The next question, the Minister of Toronto Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Minister of Education. As we confirmed yesterday, the RCMP is investigating the shadowy group Vaughan Working Families for breaking election laws. We know this group has deep ties to the Premier and the Minister of Education. We also know the Premier and the Minister happened to attend a Florida hockey game in December 2018 with the group's chair. And, Speaker, I'm sure the snacks were wonderful in the box seats. However, Ontarians deserve to know if the Minister of Education has anything to add, but he avoided answering my questions yesterday. Has the Minister of Education met with the RCMP regarding this investigation? And if so, what did he tell them? Government House Leader. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, as I uh, said yesterday, uh, it's my understanding that uh, the Chief Electoral Officer uh, conducted uh, uh, an inquiry into this and has uh, uh, since been referred off to authorities. I have full confidence that they'll, uh, they have all of the resources and, uh, and whatever they need to conduct a thorough investigation. Thank you. Supplementary. Back. The member for Northumberland, stop the clock. The member for Northumberland, Peterborough South, will come to order. Start the clock. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. To the Premier. The Premier has traded favours behind closed doors with the same people who are involved in the shadowy group ever since he was elected. Globe and Mail has revealed that the group uses the Premier's own lawyer, Stephen Thiel, as legal counsel. The Premier gave one of the group's former directors, Quinto Anabali, a plum position as the LCBO's vice chair. And now, the government has used the pandemic as cover to cut development deals for the chair of this group, Michael de Gasparis, the same developer who hosted the Premier at a Florida hockey game. Remember those snacks. Will the Premier tell the Ontario government, the people of Ontario, what he knows about this whole mess? Will he ensure his government cuts all time with the people behind this group while they're under RCMP investigation? The government 
Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. The, the, uh, of course, the honourable member will recall that I think it was in June of last year, Elections Ontario uh, made it very clear that there was no involvement of, uh, of any party in this legislature uh, with respect to. Uh, uh, to this particular uh, particular group, but having said that, Mr. Speaker, the Elections Ontario has uh, has uh, referred it, and I'm sure the resources are in place to uh, thoroughly uh, uh, thoroughly investigate it, Mr. Speaker, to ensure that our elections continue to remain uh, uh, safe, Mr. Speaker, and that all of those who participate in it are do doing so in, in the proper fashion. Thank you. The next question, the member for Ottawa Vanier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Long-Term Care. Since the release of the Long-Term Care Commission's final report, the government has reminded us of how many new PSWs are being trained and hired to support our long-term care homes. However, what they didn't address is the shocking staff retention, retention rate, which is central to the issue, and temporary wages increase won't do it. Recommendations were made by the Commissioner of Long-Term Care Public Inquiry and were repeated in the Long-Term Care Commission's final report. Mr. Speaker, as the Minister has said herself, PSWs are the backbone of long-term care homes, and I couldn't agree more. So will the Minister commit, and I believe it's worth repeating the ask, to providing PSWs safe and adequate working conditions and conformity with the Long-Term Care Commission's latest recommendation so that we may be effective in attracting and retaining much-needed PSWs. Thank you for that question. Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and, and thank you very much uh, for that important question. Uh, we acted very early in our mandate as a government to address long-term care, and we created the staffing uh, strategy, the staffing plan, and uh, eventually it emerged as a better place to work and a better place to live. Um, and, and so that is exactly why we're working on those four hours of direct care per resident per day, making sure that we are supporting our PSWs uh, in our long-term care homes, because as the member opposite has mentioned, it is about retention. Mm -hmm. When we look at the 8,600 and more that we were able to hire in with the pandemic pay, it needs to be about ret retaining them as well. And we're, we're training uh, over 17,000 uh, right now in terms of PSWs, and making sure that the staff is there to provide those four hours of direct care. Uh, and as we know, uh, when we see the shortages during this tragic pandemic, how this impacts the staff Response. that are there. So we're taking the measures to address this. We're taking the measures to support our PSWs, and we will continue to take measures to make sure that they are supported and the environment and conditions that they work in are, are optimum for their safety. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, and again to the Minister of Long-Term Care. Mr. Speaker, my colleagues in this House have, been, have made it clear that while previous government took significant steps towards improving long-term care, much more could or should have been done. My colleagues and I can recognize past shortfalls. The Minister should be able to do the same. The loss of nearly 4,000 Ontarians living and working in long-term care is completely heartbreaking, and the Minister must admit that the government didn't do enough. The families and workers affected by these losses deserve a government that takes ownership and commit to do better. According to evidence presented in the report, the government failed to adequately protect long-term care residents during the pandemic. Can the minister commit to do better by implementing the recommendation the government itself asked for? Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you again. Uh, you know, those recommendations from the commission, uh, commissioners and then the commission report are very insightful and we very much appreciate them. It has to be about making things better. Uh, that's what we've said all along. In terms of uh, our, our efforts, we began immediately with the staffing, with the capacity issues, making sure that we had the, the innovative programs to, to allow people to stay in their homes as long as possible and as long as they could, if they wish to do so. Uh, this is part of the staffing plan for those four hours of direct care, making sure that our, our, uh, our staff are, are supported and looked after. This is all part of a complex issue uh, in terms of how we address an aging population, create the staffing necessary for this aging population. And, and these measures were long neglected. Could we move faster as a government? That has been our whole intent. COVID moved faster. Do I regret that we couldn't move faster? Response. Absolutely. Uh, you know, and I acknowledge the responsibility that we have, each and every one of us here, to make things better in long-term care, particularly myself and particularly our government, which we are tasked to do, which we will do. Thank you. 
The next question, the member for Ottawa West Nepean. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health. In my riding and across Ottawa, I hear from many constituents, like childcare workers, who cannot work from home. They are anxious to get their vaccines so they can continue to provide high-quality care to our children. Speaker, can the Minister please tell this House what we are doing to support these important workers? Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for Ottawa West Nepean for this important question. Speaker, starting tomorrow, May 6 at 8 a.m., even more Ontarians who cannot work from home will be eligible to book their vaccination appointments through the provincial booking system. These include remaining elementary and secondary school workers, workers responding to critical events, food manufacturing and distribution workers, remaining individuals working in licensed childcare settings foster care agenda workers, agriculture, and farm workers. Mr. Speaker, as more vaccine supply becomes available from the federal government, we will continue to expand the list of who's eligible to receive the vaccine, including more critical workers who cannot work from home. Supplementary. For you, Speaker, thank you for that response. Speaker, despite an inconsistent vaccine supply to date, our government has continued to build a solid foundation in Ontario's vaccine rollout with a focus on age and risk, allowing us to reach our most vulnerable populations and have a measurable impact. For example, Speaker, I was particularly proud when Ontario became the first province in Canada to prioritize individuals with developmental disabilities for vaccines as part of our phase two rollout. Speaker, can the Minister of Health please update this House on the status of our vaccination program for the month of May? Thank you, Speaker. Minister of Health. Well, thank you again to the member for that question. And I am very pleased to report that last week we achieved our goal of administering first doses of COVID-19 vaccines to 40% of Ontarians 18 years of age and older. As of today, over 5.6 million doses have been administered. In just two days, since we opened up booking eligibility to more groups of Ontarians, over 700,000 appointments have been made through the provincial booking system. On Monday alone, 420,000 appointments were made, and the system held up. Importantly, Mr. Speaker, over 91% of Ontarians over age 80 have received at least one dose. Over 25,000 first and second doses have been administered in 31 fly-in First Nations communities and Moosonee, and 95% of long-term care residents are now fully vaccinated. Response. Mr. Speaker, I strongly encourage everyone to sign up to receive a vaccine as soon as it's their turn. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Tewetna. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Long-Term Care. Uh, speaker, uh, I read the report for the Long-Term Care COVID-19 Commission uh, with uh, great sadness. Uh, um, speaker, uh, in our way of life as Indigenous people, it is unimaginable, un unimaginable that we ask uh, our elders to leave home on a plane to look after, to be looked after by other people. But this is the reality because uh, we have so few uh, long-term care beds in Kiwetnuk. Uh, we des desperately need more long-term care beds uh, across the region and far northern Ontario. Speaker, uh, I hear these things, these numbers being thrown around, 15,000, 30,000. Why hasn't the government not taken any action to get 76, 76 long-term care beds they promised uh, to uh, Sulakot Minion Health Centre in 2018? Thank you. Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and, and I appreciate the, uh, the question from the member opposite. Uh, during our last round of, um, of uh, projects, 80 projects, in that included uh, projects for the Indigenous communities, because we believe that this is a very important area, as well as the Francophone um, communities and other, other groups that we recognize the importance of being able to serve people in their own language, serve people with, peop uh, with, uh, with communities of care that are consistent with their cultural needs. We understand that as a government, and that's exactly why we've included those in the last round of, uh, of projects, and we'll continue to have this top of mind. 
Uh, thank you for mentioning that. And the supplementary. Back to the Minister. Uh, speaker, uh, we cannot measure the impact of uh, you know, approximately 4,000 deaths in long-term care from COVID uh, to those families. You know, uh, when I think about that number, uh, the number is nearly the whole municipality of Solikul, where I come from. Speaker, uh, the Commission's report said the lack of Indigenous long-term care homes leads to elders, especially to those who speak their language, being cut off from the love, the contact of their families and communities. I've said this uh, before, Mr. Speaker, the elders leave and die alone, far away from their families where they aren't flown home until they have died. How cruel. When would this government fulfill its promise? Premier was in uh, Solikot, actually, in, uh, in 2018. Question. When will the uh, promise that was made three years ago and invest in culturally appropriate long-term care homes for our elders in Kiwet Nuk Miigwech? And the Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker. And again, thank you to the member opposite. This government is absolutely committed to making sure that we look after the Indigenous communities and the Francophone communities and other, uh, other groups that have specific needs uh, for their cultural uh, respect. And that was also clear in the Commission report, as you've mentioned. This is something that our government is endeavouring to make up for lost time uh, from previous, uh, previous decades. We'll continue to keep this uh, at, uh, in the forefront and, uh, and address these issues. Thank you. The next question, the member for York Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health. This morning, Ontario Soccer sent a letter to the Premier urging that the social and physical neglect of Ontario's kids must stop. Ontario Soccer stressed that organized and controlled sports are safe for Ontario's youth and that it's time we take the mental health of three million Ontario children and youth seriously. Today, I'll be participating with half a million soccer players in the Let Us Play campaign, and I encourage everyone to take a picture with hashtag Let Us Play, post it on social media, and send it to your MPP. However, yesterday the health minister said that hospitals and ICU numbers have to go down and, most incredibly, that the backlog of surgeries would have to be worked through before the ban on outdoor sports and other restrictions can be lifted. My question to the Minister of Health, will she listen to all the experts who unanimously say that the outdoors are safe and, to quote Ontario Soccer, stop the social and physical neglect of Ontario's kids and hashtag let us play? Minister of Health. And uh, thank you to the member for the question. We certainly encourage people, especially as the weather gets nicer, to be outside, to go for a walk, to go for a run, to walk the dog. Uh, but organized sports right now are not something that we can encourage based on the medical advice that we've received from the experts, that it, the levels of transmission are still too high in our communities. We need to make sure that people stay at home as much as possible. The levels are starting to go down, but it's still too early to say because of the variance of concern. We want to make sure that everyone in Ontario is, stays healthy and protected, even as we increase our vaccination rate. But we really encourage people to please go out, please get your exercise, please let children run out and, and be outside. But right at this moment, organized sports are not something that the medical experts have advised that we should allow to have happen because of the high risk of transmission. Thank you. And the supplementary. Thank you. Back to the Minister. Speaker, it's time for another chapter in the adventures of Steiny Brown in Ontario land. During his modelling briefing on April 16, which called for the most recent round of restrictions, Dr. Steiny Brown said that under the strictest measures, Ontario will peak around April 28 with 7,000 daily cases. Strictest measures were not implemented because almost every police force in the province thwarted this government's attempt to impose martial law. But on April 28, despite looser measures, if that's even possible, Ontario reported under 3,500 daily cases, or less than half than Dr. Steiny Brown predicted. It's on the basis of Brown's and the Ontario Science Table faulty modelling that millions of lives are being ruined daily, including those of 3 million children and youth referenced in the letter by Ontario Soccer. So why does the minister continue to make far-reaching decisions based on junk modelling instead of firing Steiny Brown and the Ontario Science Table for being wrong time and time again? Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Speaker. Well, I'm, I'm not sure why the member is 
uh, ridiculing the efforts of some of the medical experts that are providing us with advice, but we are receiving advice for a number of people who are epidemiologists who understand the issues here. They are providing us with their best advice with respect to levels of transmission, what we can expect in terms of hospitalization, uh, intensive care units. We've mo we have acted on the basis of the advice that we've received. We've built up our capacity in our hospitals. We've started our vaccination program. We've extended 50% of our doses from each allocation to go into the hotspot areas. We take very seriously the medical advice that we've been receiving since the beginning of this pandemic, and we will continue to do so. Thank you. And the next question, the member for Ottawa Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Recently, the government announced that adults 18 and older living in three Ottawa postal codes will be able to book a COVID-19 vaccine appointment. One of the postal codes is K2V in Canada, which is below the provincial average in terms of COVID incidence rates. Meanwhile, priority neighbourhoods identified by Ottawa Public Health and Ottawa Centre, including Centretown West and Carlington, are nowhere to be found on the government's priority list. Local city councillors, speaker, our mayor and journalists have all questioned K2V's inclusion as a priority area, and Ottawa's Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Vera Etch, has confirmed she had no involvement in this decision. So can the Premier kindly explain why a postal code ranked 11th in Ottawa for COVID cases per capita is being prioritized instead of some of our hardest-hit communities? Yes, well, yes, I can certainly respond to that question. K2V in Ottawa, uh, since the start of the pandemic to January, had 44 per cent more COVID-19 ICU cases per 100,000 than the provincial average. As well, this postal code saw 25 per cent more COVID-19 deaths. This is combined with the postal code seeing 30 per cent more COVID-19 cases per 10,000 when compared to the provincial average. Over 40% of its population was made up of racialized communities where vaccine hesitancy was a, was a concern. However, I would also say that in addition to the 114 um, hotspot areas that have been identified for us by the medical experts, that the local area, the local Ottawa Public Health Unit, is also able to use their allocation in order to identify their own hotspot areas and be able to deal with them in the same way. So there Response. are significant uh, volumes of vaccines that are being granted, not just the 50% that are going to the hotspot areas, but also to the public health units themselves. And the Chief Medical Officer of Health in Ottawa is able to use whatever percentage of that allocation that comes to them to use in the hotspot areas that have been identified in Ottawa. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. I, I confess. I don't understand the research basis of that response because people in Ottawa want to know why a postal code represented by this government's minister of long-term care was chosen when it is actually not a COVID hotspot by any objective measure made clear to our office in Ottawa Centre. Let me, let me demonstrate some of the people asking these questions, Speaker. People like Karen Secord, who manages the Parkdale Food Centre. Her staff work on a daily basis with many of our city's most marginalized residents, newcomers, people living in poverty. She wants to know when her staff will be vaccinated because people are already getting sick as they're trying to do this important work. She wants to know why K2V, which is low on our COVID hotspot in our city, has been prioritized. And if it's a coincidence that this riding happens to be represented by a cabinet minister in this government. Speaker, when will the government start focusing? on getting vaccines to the people who need them most Question. instead of playing politics during a pandemic. And to reply, the Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. And through you, Mr. Speaker, I would say to the member opposite that any suggestion that these hotspots were identified on any basis other than the medical evidence and the medic what the medical experts have suggested to us is absolutely absurd. This decision was made based on the advice that was obtained from public health. I've already given you the specific data about why K2B was chosen. It was chosen on the basis of hospitalizations, higher levels of COVID. That, that, those were the medical decisions upon which this was based. That is what we're dealing with. But as I also indicated, it is clear that the uh, Chief Medical Officer of Health in Ottawa can also identify 
hot spots and to be able to uh, allocate doses accordingly. That's what's being done by all 34 public health unit regions in, across Ontario, and it's certainly available to be used by the Chief Medical Officer in Ottawa as well. In response. Question. The member for Ottawa. Sorry. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, about five days ago, the Long-Term Care Commission dropped a very sobering report, and the minister and the premier have failed to accept responsibility for decisions that were made between the first and the second wave. Families are looking for answers. But perhaps the Premier is distracted. We learned yesterday that the RCMP is now investigating the Vaughan Working Group's attack ads against teachers, ads that were paid for by his friends. And now we heard yesterday that the Premier's pick for OLG chair has had to step down because there's another police investigation. And the more things change, the more they stay the same. Speaker, Ontario's families deserve better. They deserve a government that's not creating its own chaos so it can't address things like the long-term care report or listen to the COVID-19 science table. And now we hear that we may Question. not be sitting next week. The government has created this chaos. So, Speaker, through you, is the government prepared to lead this province Order. to the third wave, or have they created too much chaos for themselves and want to get out of this place? To reply, the government house leader. I guess it's, it's not unique that the Liberal members would be making up stuff. Uh, they did it for 15 years as a government, Mr. Speaker. So let me say very clearly to the member— uh, Caution the government house leader on its language. Uh, but let me say very clearly to the member, uh, the member opposite, uh, uh, what we inherited uh, was a system that was broken, not only in long-term care but in health care. This was a member whose leader sat at a cabinet table for many, many years and left us with an ICU capacity that was one of the lowest in Canada. The Liberals failed. They left us with a system that hadn't been reformed for years. Their failure. Instead of investing the, uh, the billions of dollars that the then federal government or Stephen Harper were transferring to the province of Ontario for health care, they used only half of that money and trans transferred the rest to who knows what, Mr. Speaker. They built 400, 600 long-term care beds under the last uh, uh, 10 years of their mandate, Mr. Speaker. By every Response. single measure, the Liberals left us in such a situation, Mr. Speaker, that we had to play defense for a year. We are now on the offense, and we are winning this battle. All Ontarians are winning this battle, Mr. Speaker. There is a light at the end of the tunnel, and it won't be because of the work that the Liberals did. It'll be in spite of that work. Thank you. Thank you. There being no further business this morning, this House stands in recess, I believe, until 3 p.m.